good morning, Calvary Temple family. We're so glad you joined us today online, and we've got an incredible service planned for you today that's going to be great as we worship God and hear about what God wants to do in your life. Uh, just uh, I'm thinking about what's what's happening uh, here at Calvary Temple. You know, Calvary Temple is all about community. We want to really develop community and 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 a connection with one another. We love to have uh, people come and just be able to be connected with one another, to help one another through difficult times, to be there to encourage one another. And uh, with that being said, September, we're starting our, our new small group ministries. If you'd like to be a part of that small group ministry, please text that number at the bottom of your screen there. We'll be glad to send you the information so you'll know where they're taking place, what times they are, what days, so that you'll be able to just be a part of this. It's just kind of a laid back form where people just really are able to fellowship and grow in community with one another. You know, today's exciting is we're going to worship God. And, and um, the message today I want to share with you, I'm really excited about as we talk about that the more that we surrender to God, the more we can trust Him and know that all things are possible. All things, no matter what you're going through today, I want you to know all things are possible. God wants to do a work in your life if you'll let Him. But He's asking you to submit and surrender your life to Him and he'll make sure everything else is taken care of. Hey, before we get into the worship time, let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your love and your mercy and your grace. I thank you, Lord, that you love us so very much that you want the very best for us. And we're thankful that your word tells us over and over again that all things are possible through you, God, and that if we trust you, that we don't have to worry about a thing because you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask, think, or comprehend. And so, Lord, today we yield ourselves to you. We surrender ourselves completely to you, and we ask you, God, to just do what only you can in our lives. We give you the praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's get ready to worship God. a promised land waiting for me sometimes there's an ocean that lies in between i'll keep on traveling the path where you've been till i'm right where you want me that's where i will be for freedom's coming and it has a name oh no room for my chains oh you take them away for freedom's coming and it has a name and it is jesus how sweet is the name you said 
its freedom that I was set free. Now I walk in the victory that you won for me. And on the journey, the walls that remain, I'll sing in the promise that you're making a way for freedom's coming. And it has a name, hold over for my chains. Oh, you take them away for freedom. Watch them fall as we lift your name. Strongholds break, sin erased. Wash by grace in the power of your name. One by one, chain by chain. Watch them fall as we lift your name. Strongholds break. power of your name for freedom's coming and it has a name oh no room for my chains oh you take them away for freedom's coming and it has a name and it is Jesus how sweet is the name for freedom's coming and it has a name oh no room for my chains oh you Thanks again for joining us here at Calvary Temple Online. We love connecting with you each and every week. Hey, grab your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 10. We're going to get right into our message here. Mark chapter 10, we're going to be looking there again today as we're continuing in our series entitled, This is the Way. We're following Jesus. We're following the way that he set before us, his example, emulating him in every way. As you're turning there, I, I love coming across different memes that I find to be cute or funny. I, I thought this one was kind of cute. Uh, the, the shirt said, the girl's shirt, she's pregnant, says, don't eat watermelon seeds. Water. How many, when you were kids, you thought that that was really the truth? You didn't want to eat a watermelon seed because you thought that you might have a watermelon in your stomach. It might grow in there, you know? Well, I thought it was cute. Anyway, speaking of watermelons, I thought this was quite humorous. This uh, watermelon, it says, um, it says boneless instead of seedless boneless. I thought that was pretty funny, uh, the packaging there. Speaking of, 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 of produce, though, in the grocery store, uh, one comedian said this, I didn't know this, organic is a grocery term meaning twice as expensive. How many have found that to be true, right? I mean, it's significantly more if they write the word organic, right? All right. 
Well, and speaking of things that cost and what, what costs, I thought this was pretty funny. You got a bag of plastic pennies. There's 100 plastic pennies in there. You can buy that, pla- that bag of 100 plastic pennies for $3.49. Doesn't make any sense to me, right? Why not just give your kid a 100 pennies? It'll only be a dollar. Anyway. Well, speaking of that, I, I thought this kind of appropriate for what we're talking about today. Nothing starts with N and ends in G and ends with G. Nothing starts with N and ends with G. Take you a minute, maybe. Anyway, we're not going to talk about nothing. We're going to talk about all things, all things today. And as we're going there, let's, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that all things are possible through you. And today we want to allow you to work all things in our life and to, we want to submit all of ourselves to you. We want to surrender ourselves and depend upon you in a greater dimension, a greater way than ever before to give you 100% of us all. And so Lord, speak through this mouthpiece and challenge us today to be more like you in every way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're looking again at the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Now, this chapter actually contains four sayings of Jesus that serve as the foundation of the Christian life. Now, if you want to embark on a spiritual journey and live your life in the presence of God, the four fundamental principles uh, that are summed up in Jesus' words all throughout this chapter are essential for you to learn and for you to live by. Now, we looked at the first principle last week. What did Jesus say in last week's message? He said in Mark chapter 10, verse 15, I tell you the truth, anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Now, how does a child receive the kingdom of God? In total dependence and in complete humility. So we will never get to the stage in life where we no longer need God's grace to sustain us. And in this way, we must be like little children, humble and and just completely dependent upon him. Well, today's story builds upon this particular principle. It's called the story of the rich young ruler. Now, it appears in Matthew and Mark and in Luke. Matthew refers to him as young. Luke refers to him as a ruler. And all three of them, he is referred to as rich. So he's called the rich young ruler. Now, let's look at the story. It's found in Mark chapter 10. Let's begin reading in verse 17. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Asked Jesus. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing that you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, we're going to continue that story in just a minute. But first, I I want to make a couple of observations from this section. You see, the first observation is that the flurry of emotion, it isn't enough to sustain the spiritual life. Notice how this man approached Jesus. He came running. He fell to his knees. He addressed Jesus in exalted terms. Now, it was a great beginning. It was full of emotion, but as we're going to see later, it was a beginning without substance. The man, even though he appeared to be sincere, he was actually salvation shopping. He didn't come to Jesus and say, I surrender all. He came to Jesus asking, what do I have to do? In other words, what are the minimum system requirements for this to work in my life? What's your best price? What, what, what is the, the very minimal amount that I have to do? You know, many people approach Christianity with this very mindset. What's the minimum that I must do in order to be saved? Or to put it another way, as I saw in a bumper sticker one time, how much sin can I commit and still get to heaven? Now, with the running and with the kneeling and with the flattery, this man made a great first impression. But what we learn is that the Christian life goes much deeper than first impressions. It goes much deeper than just shows of emotion. It goes much deeper than surface level respectability. Second thing, though, another observation that we find is that Jesus can't be fooled with insincere 
religious talk. He can't be fooled by that insincere religious talk with, with uh, more of a uh, uh, trying to, to, to be something that you're not. You know, the man refers to Jesus as good teacher. You know, he no doubt expected Jesus to respond, as really was the custom of that day, that Jesus would respond, you know, equally re- in equally respectful terms. You know, oh, most honored and good sir. Instead, Jesus asked him a question. He said, why did you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Or only God is good. Now, was Jesus saying that he isn't God? I mean, was he saying that he isn't good? Of course not. In fact, Jesus didn't say, don't call me good. He said, why do you call me good? You know, it was almost as if he was saying, do you know who you're really talking to? Are are you calling me good because you believe that I'm the Messiah, that I'm God? Or is this just some more smooth talk? You see, the temptation among many people is to politely dismiss Jesus as a good man or a great teacher or an outspoken prophet, maybe even a brilliant thinker that was ahead of his time. But i got to tell you, none of these labels are enough. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the only way to salvation, the only way to God. He claimed to have the power to forgive sins, to, to claim, he claimed to, to have existed for all eternity. He claimed to be equal with God. Now, listen, a person who claims these things is either a liar of insane proportion or he's telling the truth. Now it's up to you to decide for yourself. You know, there was an episode of, of, of the show Frasier in which Frasier endorsed a, a, a seemingly ideal political candidate. And then later he discovered that that candidate believes that he was abducted by aliens. Now, Frasier is torn because even though he agrees with all the things this candidate stands for, he also knows that somebody who believes they were abducted by aliens had no business serving in political leadership. You know, that same principle applies to Jesus. Somebody who claims to be God and claims to be going away to heaven to build mansions for his followers cannot be dismissed as a good man and a good teacher. I mean, either he is having dangerous delusions of grandeur or he's telling the truth about himself. I mean, if he's lying, he has no business being called a good teacher. And if he's telling the truth, then we have to accept him on his terms. Do you know how we know that he's telling the truth? Because he conquered death. You see, Jesus conquered death. One Friday afternoon, they put his lifeless body in a cold, dark tomb, presumably forever. But on the third day, the breath of God entered into his lungs. His blood began to flow in his veins once again. His eyes were open and filled with light, and he stood up on his feet in resurrection power. And this so-called good teacher was once dead and, 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 and now alive once again, having conquered the power of death and having proven that he is who he says he is. Now let's continue this story. Jump down to verse 21. Verse 21, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing that you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now at this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, this amazed them, but Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. Now, some other translations say this, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus continued on in verse 25. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Now, a couple more observations from this this section right here, okay? Number one, love speaks what is necessary. We find here that love speaks what is necessary. Mark has a way of including certain details that bring color and significance to the story. Now, here he, he makes a point of saying that Jesus loved this man. He says this specifically, I think, because as we see, Jesus is about to let the man slip away. Mark wanted his readers to understand that this wasn't because Jesus didn't care. I mean, he loved him. But no matter how much you love someone, it doesn't change the truth. And it doesn't change what's necessary. This man came to Jesus wanting to negotiate the terms of salvation. And the terms of salvation are non-negotiable. 
He wanted Jesus to give him something doable. Something, you know, along the lines of what he was already doing. You know, he was probably willing to do even more, you know, to try a little harder, to maybe even give a greater percentage of his income to the temple. But Jesus said in effect to him, you know what, that's not how it works. You don't receive eternal life when you've done everything on a checklist. You receive eternal life when you surrender to God everything that's dear to you. You know, another observation I think that we find here is that an attachment to money can ruin your life. An attachment to money can ruin your life. Jesus doesn't pull any punches when it comes to wealth. He said how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And then he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I gotta say, when we hear the term rich man, we usually think, oh, that would be like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or Elon Musk, but, but not me, not me. The truth is, compared to the rest of the world, folks, compared to the rest of the world that, that, that we live in, everyone that's watching this program most likely is rich or close to it. I mean, when we compare ourselves to how the rest of the world is, okay? However, it, it, the fact of the matter is it's not really a question of your net worth or the bottom line on your balance sheet. It is really a question of whether or not that you trust in riches. It's a question of whether or not you would rather be financially secure than eternally secure. Let me say that again so you can understand what I'm saying. It is, it is whether you want to be financially secure or eternally secure. Jesus never had much good to say about money, really. In fact, he talked a lot about the destructive power of wealth. And that's because people can easily allow themselves to be seduced by the lure of things to the point of abandoning their spiritual priorities. William Barclay tells a great story about the 18th century poet Samuel Johnson. Now, Dr. Johnson was being shown around this lavish castle estate and he turned to those that were with him and he said this he said these things these are these are things that make it difficult to die have you ever felt that way oh man i love this car so much i don't ever want to lose it i, I want to take it to heaven with me I, I i want to see what this baby does on streets of gold you know possessions and the desire for for more in our life they just have this way of gripping your soul and distorting your values even to the point where you think that just owning a few toys or getting a piece of paper in the mail each month with enough numbers on it, it is better than spending eternity with jesus i'll tell you the lure of money and the desire for more has a way of giving you a false sense of security we're oftentimes tempted to think, you know, if I only had a sizable and steady stream of cash coming in, I, I would be so happy. I mean, all of my problems would be solved and all my worries would just disappear. I got to tell you, the desire for more also has a way of making you greedy. Recently, a friend said to me, he said, you know, with the money that I'm making today, I have nothing to complain about. Now, now it's true he's doing quite well and he's enjoying himself. But he told me about a, a wonderful vacation he and his wife had just recently taken to Jamaica. Now, a few minutes later, as we were talking, we began to talk about uh, uh, the, the, the church's new sanctuary that they were building. And, and he said, you know, I'm just not in a position to increase my giving right now. Now, listen, I, I don't begrudge anyone a trip to Jamaica or a nice house or a nice car. But we have to watch out that our possessions don't begin to own us and that we don't become driven by a, a never ending lust for more. And that's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, beware, guard yourself against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. You know, when people read the story of the rich young ruler, they'll oftentimes ask, you know, does this mean that God expects all of us to sell everything that we have and become poor? Now, the short answer to this is no. No, we don't see this requirement of anybody else in Scripture. In fact, you remember the story of Zacchaeus? You know, remember the, the wee little man in, that was up in the sycamore tree who happened to be a, a rich tax collector? Now, when he decided to become a follower of Jesus, he said to Jesus, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And what did Jesus say in response to that? Jesus said, 50, 50%? Hey, no, 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 not so fast, little man. Try 100% and then we'll talk. That's not what Jesus said, is it? No. Instead, he said in Luke chapter 19, verse 9, he said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house. In fact, when Paul was writing to Timothy, he said to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world. 
To do what though? To do what? Command those that are rich to sell everything that they have and to live the rest of their lives in poverty? No. Here's what he said. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So why did Jesus tell this rich young man that he must sell everything that he has and give it all away? Well, the answer is the principle that I believe today's story teaches us. Jesus knew that there was one thing that stood in the way of this man from living a life that was fully devoted to God. It wasn't the fact that he had wealth. It was his attachment to his security blanket. It was his attachment to that wealth. You see, the rich young man didn't mind being a, a good member of the synagogue. He didn't mind, you know, giving an appropriated nod to God every week. He didn't even mind living according to certain moral principles. But where he drew the line was in letting go of what really matters. And that is the comfort and the security that he was convinced only money could buy. And that's why Jesus said that it's difficult for those who have riches or for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's something about having money that causes many people to believe that money is all that matters. Now, does it have to be that way? No, not at all. It comes down to what you choose as your security blanket, to what you choose as your security blanket. You know, an attachment to money or anything that you become dependent upon other than God can ruin your life. It can mess your life up. Now, what is the one thing that you can't let go of, even for God? You know, for many people, it's money or, or, or the desire for money. You know, for some people, it's sex. For others, it's prestige. For others, it's some kind of addiction. For others, it's still maybe even a hobby or the pursuit of pleasure. Now, these security blankets, they, they come in all shapes and sizes. They have something in common, though, with one another, and that is they have convinced you that what they can offer is greater than what you'll experience in a life that is fully devoted to God. The fact is that we all have these, these security blankets. We all have at least one or two even, really, of those things. We all have that thing, though, you know, or maybe those things, that potentially stand in the way of our living a, a committed life to God. And oftentimes we think, oh man, this is something that I can never let go of. This is something I can never live without, something I could never be free from. I, I can't tell you how many times over the years somebody has said to me, you know, I would like to be a Christian, but I know that I will never live up to it. I, you know, I'm just afraid that, that I'm, I'm actually just afraid to try because I know that I'll fail. I've also known many Christians who are, are trying to live in that never, never land of partial discipleship. And they've said, I, I know that I need to be fully devoted to God. I need to be sold out. I need to be radical for God. I'm just afraid to try because I, I know I'll fail. I'm telling you, that's where today's principle comes in. That's where it comes in. Jesus says here in Mark chapter 10, beginning verse 25, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed. And they said to, to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with, not with God. All things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. This principle of believing in the impossible is something that Jesus mentions in the previous chapters and even in the following chapter. You know, in Mark chapter 9, uh, verse 23, he says, all things are possible for one who believes. And in Mark chapter 11, he says, in verse 23, if you have faith in God and don't doubt, you can tell this mountain to get up and jump into the sea. And it will. Everything you ask for in prayer will be yours if you only have faith. And again, in today's story here in verse 27, he says, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Now, this brings us to the principle that I want you to pick up today, pick up on today. And that is that God will call you to the point of your perceived impossibilities. God will call you to the point of your perceived impossibilities. If you will then at that point take the next step, you'll experience unlimited possibilities in him. 
I mean, when you hear the phrase, all things are possible with God, we oftentimes think, oh, that means God can heal me, or, or that means God can meet my financial need, or that means God can solve this problem or that problem. That means God can, you know, change my situation. Now, listen, those things are true. But most significantly, as we see it in the context of this story, it means that God can change you. God can change you. You can't save yourself. You can only surrender yourself. But when you do, there's no limit to what God can accomplish in your life. Now, for those of you that think, oh, I can never do that. I mean, I, I, I can never, never do what you're talking about. Listen, I have a word for you. All things are possible with God. All things. For those of you who think I can never change this about myself, I have good news. All things are possible with God. For those of you maybe that think, you know what, I'm too weak. I, 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 I'm too shy to stick with it. I want you to know this. All things are possible with God. And for those of you that think I can never pay this price, never forget all things are possible with God. This is the principle that Jesus is giving us. All things are possible with God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, as Paul paraphrases it here, he, he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. All things. Listen, your future is not determined by your weaknesses. It is determined by God's greatness. It's not determined by what you can't do or what you can't let go of. It's determined by his power to change you when you surrender your weaknesses to him and you depend on him for help. Whatever you're dependent upon, I want to encourage you today, lay it down at his feet and trust him to take care of you. You follow him. Why? Because this is the way. This is the way. By following Jesus, he is the only way to God. You know, in closing, we, we, we know how the story of the rich young ruler ends, right? But what if it ended differently? What if it ended differently? What if this rich young ruler would have said, okay, Jesus, I'll go and I'll sell all that I have. I'll give it away so that I can follow you. What would have happened next? Jesus told his disciples there in verse 29. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. Wait a minute, Pastor. Is he saying that if you give away one home, that you will get back exactly 100? No, no. This is the typical Jewish way of using uh, hyperboles to make a point. Just like Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. He was using hyperboles or, or, or an exaggeration to make a point. And he's doing the same thing here. He's saying that whatever you surrender to God, you get back and then some. I mean, if your family rejects you for following Jesus, you'll find that when you, when you receive Christ, when you come to Christ and you're a part of the family of God, you've got more brothers and more sisters than you know what to do with. If you give up the security of your wealth, you will find yourself living in the security of God's wealth and he'll meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. See, the more you give to God, the more he gives back to you directly and indirectly. Jesus also says that these things come your way along with persecutions. That's also true. I mean, troubles are a fact of life. They always will be. In fact, we looked at that a couple of weeks ago. Listen, life's not a picnic. It, it is a, an exciting, adventurous journey, a journey that's made all the more worthwhile when we remember the essential rule of the road here and this, this principle that we're looking at today, and that is that all things are possible with God. All things are possible if you'll put your faith and your trust in him. You won't be disappointed. In fact, in saying that, if you've never opened your heart or life to Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you right now that if you will surrender to him, if you will just allow him to come into your life, to make that connection, to begin that relationship, if you receive the gift that he's offering to you of forgiveness of sins, your life will be changed. And you'll be able to experience and know because of the faith that rises inside of you that all things are possible, that God can accomplish all things. So today, if you've never opened your heart or life to Jesus, I want to encourage you right now just to pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me so much. 
that you willingly gave your life upon the cross of Calvary. I receive the forgiveness that that price paid for me. I receive your forgiveness of sins today. I believe, I, right now, you've washed me clean. I have a fresh start. Lord, I ask you today to come into my life, to be my Lord and Savior. I want to begin a relationship with you right here and right now. And I'm trusting you that, you, that all things are possible, and that includes that you can change me to be more like you in every way. I give you the praise and glory and the honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I want you to put, put in the comment section, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I want to celebrate with you. I want to rejoice in that your life will be changed as God begins to do a work in your life as you that relationship with him continues to build and grow. You know, many others today, you just needed that reminder today that all things are possible. And many of us, many times, we're holding on to things. We're holding back. We've not given 100%. Maybe we're at that 95, 99%, but we've not gone over the, the top with that 100% of surrendering to God. I want to encourage you, when you surrender to God, and that's what he's talking about here, just surrendering and becoming completely, fully, 100% reliant upon God, then you can uh, trust in him that all things are possible and he'll work all things together for good in your life so let's close in prayer and just trust god to do that in each one of our lives father i thank you today for this incredible principle that we learned today that all things are possible with you lord we knew that we know that and wrote but lord help us to put it into practice help us god to be able to to walk each and every moment of every day in full and complete reliance upon you depending on you and totally surrendering to you, not allowing anything to keep us from fully surrendering to you, God, from being completely and 100% surrendered. Lord, we know that when we do that and we depend upon you, we don't have to worry about a thing because, Lord, you'll work all things together for good because all things are possible with you. And we give you the praise and glory for that reminder today. We lay everything at your feet, all of our problems, all of our situations, our entire life. And Lord, we know that you're going to bless us because we know all those all things are possible we give the praise in jesus name amen amen well god bless you we look forward to connecting with you again next week